So hello everybody and uh, welcome back to uh, today's third session. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed the uh, the various showcase sessions that we had running uh, just now. And uh, just a quick reminder to you all, as those were running in parallel, uh, for if, if you want to catch up on any of those sessions that you weren't able to attend, uh, and indeed any of the other sessions that have taken place so far today and will be taking place, uh, today and throughout the duration of the event. There are recordings of all of those sessions available. Uh, there's a link in the reception area and you will also be all receiving an email towards the end of the day uh, today, after the end of the, the proceedings today, with uh, links to how you can download all of those uh, recordings and the videos of the sessions so far. Um, so straight on then to our next session. So our next session is going to be moving on to look at uh, issues around spectrum sharing and looking at technology and policy tools to increase spectrum efficiency. But we're going to be starting before that uh, with a thinking point. Uh, so uh, to introduce that and our panel and uh, the rest of the proceedings today, I'd like to now welcome to the stage Joanne LeMay uh, from LeMay Yates Associates. Hi, Joanne. Uh, good Hi, to have Dan. you. Um, Hi, yeah, hello there. Hi. Yeah, we're really looking forward to. Uh, to I'm sure it's going to be a fascinating discussion. So, uh, without further ado, I'll uh, I'll pass over to you. Thanks, Joanne. Thank you, Dan. It's uh, very nice of, of you to introduce me and to invite us for this, uh, all, as usual, uh, great conference. The second year virtual and Forum Europe does such a tremendous job for it. So, uh, so that we can uh, get right into the subject matter of uh, spectrum sharing, I'd like to introduce uh, Dave Wright, who's the head of the Ongo Alliance uh, based in the US and uh, used to be called a CBRS Alliance, if Indeed. I'm not mistaken. And so Dave uh, will try to convince all of everyone here that uh, this is, you know, sharing is the way to go uh, for spectrum between private users, utilities, commercial network, uh, commercial mobile operators, fixed wireless access. I, I have to say that uh, they've been big, big promoters of the CBRS um, framework put, put by the FCC. Uh, we did support a bidder in this auction, so it was quite interesting. Uh, we've done a fair amount of work on this. So uh, Dave, I uh, give you the floor and let's hear what you have to say. Great, thanks, Johan, appreciate it. Um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, uh, depending upon uh, depending where you are around the globe. Glad to be here. I didn't realize my job was to convince you that uh, the sharing was necessarily the right outcome, but uh, I mean, uh, I personally feel like uh, there's definitely, um, you know, room for all kinds of uh, spectrum management frameworks, but uh, I did want to talk to you and I want to use this a little bit as sort of a bridge session between the earlier session on um, European approaches to verticals um, and the following session, which uh, as Dan just said, is going to be about um, both policy and technology tools to help maximize efficiency. So I think you know this is really gonna be more about um, creating the ecosystem and, and putting together an environment that really kind of um, encourages the formation of a vibrant ecosystem. So I thought about like striking a Rodin pose since uh, we framed this as a uh, uh, um, thinking point, but but I don't think you want that. So next slide, please, Dan. Um, and yeah, probably most of you are familiar with this. I'm not going to spend much time here, but I just want to set uh, up the rest of the presentation by saying it does take a good spectrum access framework in order to create an ecosystem. So obviously the fact that we have 150 megahertz of you know 3.5 prime midband spectrum that was opened by the FCC for new commercial uses um, with CBRS in the US, we are protecting the incumbent users, uh, which are mostly federal uh, military systems. But then we've introduced these two new tiers of commercial access, right? The priority access, which gives you a protected right to 10 megahertz of spectrum sold at auction, uh, licensed at the county level, 10-year terms. John mentioned that um, yeah, they supported some of the uh, participants in the auction, and I'll talk a little bit about the auction later. But um, yeah, that's the priority access tier. So yeah, pseudo-licensed um, uh, spectrum rights. And then we're introducing general uh, authorized access, or GAA, which is really, yeah, I'll call it opportunistic. I don't like... Um, saying uh, or, or terming it as unlicensed because uh, it's not truly unlicensed. It's more of a lightly licensed regime. 
Um, there is a, a requirement that you, uh, you know, enter into a relationship with one of the spectrum access systems. So over on the right, we point out that the um, the spectrum is coordinated by the spectrum access system databases. And, uh, and I do think that the SASs represent a new technology tool that can help with the efficiency uh, issues. So, you know, I'm sure that'll be addressed on the next panel. Uh, it is important to note that um, CBRS, which in 3GPP terms are, is band 48 um, and N48, or B48 and N48, I should say, you know, it does overlap uh, directly with the uh, the existing band uh, B4243 in the LTE terms, and then N77, N78 uh, in terms of 5G. And that has certainly been helpful to our ecosystem. Um, you know, we've been able to leverage the you know, wide range and, and very robust chipset and equipment um, uh, ecosystem that was there already for uh, LTE equipment and is emerging very rapidly for 5G. And I would say the fact that Europe has had um, 3.4 to 3.8 as a, a 5G pioneer band for a number of years is certainly helping there. So uh, next slide, please, Dan. What we're seeing is that you know, this, this opportunity for different types of access, whether it's protected or um, opportunistic, is really supporting, in my mind, five major use case areas. And I'm not gonna say this is an exhaustive list. I would certainly expect actually that other things will emerge that we haven't anticipated. But at this point in time, I would classify into these five major areas. So. Uh, mobile capacity augmentation, this is the uh, large national operators, mobile operators um, using CBRS to add capacity, particularly in the metro areas. Alternative cellular footprint, the reason we've shown that with a, uh, an RF coax cable um, is it's, uh, it's been, uh, CBRS has been widely um, seen by the cable industry as a way for them to build out their own cellular footprint for uh, their new mobile broadband offerings. Um, so you know, if they can onboard or onload, those subscribers in the metro areas where they have their you know, hybrid fiber coax networks, um, you know, that's economically uh, you know, attractive to them. Uh, fixed wireless, John mentioned this. Uh, certainly, um, the many of the uh, national operators are using or looking at using CBRS to extend the reach of their fixed broadband networks, but then also a number of the uh, wireless internet service or WISP community are, are very involved. Um, and as John mentioned, many of them were active in the uh, in the PAL auction as well. Um, those three use cases tend to be service provider led, um, not to say there aren't some private fixed uh, deployments and use cases, but um, largely those are service provider type deployments. And then on the right, we get into, I guess what we would call the, the verticals, right? So uh, private network deployment, so deploying a CBRS LTE or 5G network for truly internal communications needs. And then with inbuilding cellular on the far right, this is the, uh, the idea that I can then take that, um, you know, potentially private deployment that uh, is supporting my, my, you know, my employees um, or my workers, and then open that up to the subscribers of the mobile operators. So much as traditional DAS systems have done through the years um, using small cell technology uh, at a lower, you know, at a lower price point um, and also on neutral uh, frequency. So it's really a neutral small cell on a neutral spectrum uh, to provide uh, essentially neutral host services. So we think that's uh, going to be very exciting. And I put enterprise in quotes, just, uh, you know, I struggle with that uh, definition. It's such a broad range of different use cases, but um, in terms of some of the verticals that we are seeing move early on this, um, on the industrial side, I would say it's, you know, transportation, logistics, energy, utilities, manufacturing, and then on the quote unquote enterprise side, um, healthcare, higher education, hospitality, retail, um, and then the managed service provider point is simply the fact that you know, many operators, uh, you know, will be looking to develop, or excuse me, will be looking to deliver those services um, for the businesses, right? So pretty much all of the uh, the major tier one mobile operators in the U.S. have a enterprise or business uh, division, uh, which is about bringing private solutions. Next slide, please, Dan. It's probably important to note that, um, you know, there's always, you know, we talk about an ecosystem, but it's really multiple ecosystems that form around these opportunities. 
I think our, our minds or my mind, maybe it's just, you know, where I tend to sit within the uh, uh, sort of the ecosystem myself. Um, uh, you know, I tend to think about the, uh, the RAN infrastructure and then the client uh, devices. So sort of the middle and then the top right blocks here. But it's just as important to think, obviously, about who's bringing in the uh, the software components. Um, you know, with CBRS, obviously, we have the SaaS component as well. But then you have the regular uh, EPC, 5GC, um, and EMS type elements as well. Um, the end users represented in the bottom left. And then I think, you know, growing awareness that the um, you know, systems integrators are going to pl play a very critical role in delivery of service, particularly, again, for uh, private use cases and for um, those who don't have much familiarity with cellular technologies uh, in those private uh, use cases. And also for the um, in-building cellular slash neutral host use case that I talked about, um, there's going to be a growing a need for Internet Connect providers. So people who can connect all of these uh, these private deployments or neutral host deployments back to you know, call it the identity providers, which I think is largely viewed as the uh, the national mobile operators. So each one of these sub um, sub groups or sub ecosystems is important, um, and you you know really want to make sure you've got a system in place that supports uh, you know all of them. Um, occasionally, there's some comp competition. Um, people may play in different uh, in different uh, areas of the ecosystem or in different groups here, but uh, usually it's it's very cooperative, and that's what we've seen with CBRS. Uh, next slide, please, Dan. So uh, kind of a rough uh, you know, reflection of the um, uh, opportunities I talked about. This is the uh, the membership of the Alliance, our board members at the top, and then the uh, other members below. 190 strong and growing. Um, we're very, uh, you know, uh, proud of our members. Uh, they do great work. And again, tier one MNOs, largest cable operators in the country, fixed wireless providers, including the WISP community, uh, tower companies and neutral host solution providers, cellular infrastructure vendors, enterprise wireless vendors, um, fixed wireless equipment vendors, the, the hyperscalers, for lack of a better term, right? Uh, uh, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, um, integrated solutions providers, um, some leading names here in, uh, in ORAN and VRAN, um, interconnect providers, test houses, deployment planning tools, um, and then end users. Importantly, we've got a um, number of universities, New York Library, uh, real estate management firms, uh, folks who manage multi-tenant dwelling units. Uh, and we're really excited that they are in our alliance and are really helping us understand what their business needs are um, so that we can make sure that gets factored into our technical work, um, you know, uh, deployment guides, et cetera. Um, next slide, please, Dan. Sorry, I've lost my clock here. I want to make sure I stay on time. Uh, so momentum since uh, January of 2020. For those of you who've been following um, CBRS in the U.S., you'll know that the initial commercial deployment authorization was in September of 2019. And that was when the FCC, uh, working with our um, National Telecommunications Information Administration, which oversees federal spectrum, and then the, the DOD, um, who obviously is one of the prime federal users in the band. Uh, that was when they gave us the green light to begin you know, field deployments. Uh, we still had the training wheels on a little bit um, as they just made sure that all the, uh, you know, the SAS uh, coordination and the, the ESC uh, protections of the federal incumbents was working properly. But that moved quickly to a full commercial deployment authorization in January of 2020. And what that's uh, since January of 2020, we've now got 150,000 um, you know, CBRS base stations or CBSDs, as we call them, in the field. Uh, that includes both the uh, the higher power, um, which is up to 50 watts of radiated power uh, per 10 megahertz, um, what we call Category B radios, and then the lower power, which is one watt uh, per 10 megahertz of radiated power. 
Um, largely indoor can be deployed uh, outdoor, but I think you know most people see those as more indoor type deployments. Um, it's a mix of indoor outdoor. Uh, we uh, introduced the PAL tier. The, the auction, which I'll talk about, was held in August of last year. But we've actually, you know, there was a um, a period of time where the FCC was collecting the funds uh, from the uh, the winners, and then an assignment phase uh, that the uh, the SASs went through. So the PALs have begun being de uh, deployed, or we should say put into service really last month. So with that, we now really have all of the different aspects of CBRS operational, um, which is great. Uh, you know, it's, it's the you know, realization of the vision, you know, that's been in play for quite some time. But, uh, you know, that is really encouraging from my perspective. Um, on the ecosystem side at the bottom, we have over 230 different client devices that have been authorized by the FCC for the band. And the client devices really reflect the range of use cases. So it's everything from smartphones to tablets to laptops to CPE equipment, so the fixed wireless customer prem equipment to um, IoT modules and gateways, and then some mission specific devices such as barcode scanners, um, security cameras and the like. 130 different base station models, both category A and category B have been authorized. We now have nine SaaS administrators, um, which again, I think speaks to the opportunity that um, you know, the, the spectrum coordinators are seeing um, you know, from this particular ecosystem or in this particular framework uh, and thousands of CPIs or certified professional installers. Next slide, please, Dan. And I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit. Um, so the PAL auction last August, uh, 4.6 billion in proceeds was raised. Uh, there were seven licenses per county auctioned or up for auction, 10 year terms, 257 uh, different uh, bidders and 228 secured licenses and 20,000 licenses were uh, were auctioned. So this is the, you know, in, in terms of participation, it's, uh, you know, far and away the most successful auction the, uh, the FCC's ever conducted on those metrics. And it's interesting to note again, back to the use cases and, and particularly the verticals, you know, utilities, universities, real estate, um, and industrial winners, along with obviously the, uh, the mobile network operators and the cable operators. Um, I imagine that some of the panels will talk about this, but there is a, a nice opportunity for people who did not secure PAL rights at the auction to get those via the secondary market. Um, the commission has put in place a lot of incentives to make unused PAL rights available for lease. Uh, next slide, please, Dan. Um, a lot of what I've been talking about has been in the CBRS context, but I just want to highlight that, you know, aside from the SAS component, uh, this, you know, these are all equally applicable. These points are equally applicable to, you know, a local licensing regime um, or any other way that Spectrum really is made available for, you know, private or vertical type use cases. These are some of the, um, you know, ways that the Alliance is supporting the CBRS ecosystem. So, you know, our, our uh, interoperability and test uh, certification program, uh, which is the ONGO certification, um, technical specs, deployment programs and guides. We've got a private deployment guide, um, you know, for again, enterprise or, uh, well, typically enterprise folks who may not be familiar with uh, LTE and 5G technologies, a shared HNI program, um, you know, which allows uh, our, uh, you know, our end deployers in the band to have access to the cellular identifiers, the MC blocks that they need to make a network functional. So these are just all the enabling components that we have put in place for CBRS. And next slide, please, Dan. Last slide. Um, the reason I put it in those terms is as we look at the activity around the world, there are you know, obviously a number of countries, both in, uh, in Europe and South America and Asia, who are making spectrum available for you know, localized uses, whether it's industrial, enterprise, or really any of the above. Um, and again, a lot of the materials that we have produced really have applicability, regardless of how you're getting access to the spectrum. And so we brought in the remit of the Alliance. And as Johan uh, mentioned, we actually transitioned from the CBRS Alliance last year to now being the ONGO Alliance uh, in 2021. 
um, so that we could help address, uh, you know, the, the question of how do you get the ecosystem to form around these other global opportunities. So we'd be very interested in working with, um, you know, any of you regulators and policymakers who may be, you know, asking questions about, okay, you know, if we make the spectrum available, what, what are the next steps to really make sure industry responds? Uh, you know, we've seen a great response uh, in the U.S. with CBRS, and we'd love to help uh, create that same type of uh, activity in your country. Thank you very much. That was uh, it, and love to take some questions. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dave. I don't think we have a, a lot of time left, but uh, okay. let's take at least uh, uh, maybe one or two questions. I think uh, uh, you mentioned you went from CBRS to Ongo Alliance. Uh, I know the CBRS framework, you know, was set up quite a few years ago by the FCC. I think back in maybe 2014 or 2013. And at the time, you know, everything was based on 4G. Uh, that's what we expected to see. And now it's migrating to also have 5G deployment. Uh, so uh, in, in open RAN. So how, how does that, what do you see right now in the US in terms of this ban? Is it mostly 4G that's being deployed? But I know that large carriers like Verizon, they are they are planning to use this with 5G and, and some of their 5G networks. So maybe you would like to speak to that. Yeah, it's a very good question, and um, yeah, absolutely. So I, I mentioned that uh, we we definitely benefited from you know, band forty two forty three being, I think, put in place back in two thousand nine eight timeframe by the three GPP. So uh, the initial wave of equipment, both on the client and the infrastructure side, was certainly LTE equipment, and that's what um, you know, drove our initial momentum. All of the you know, sort of pilot work that went on before ICD and FCD was really LTE technology. Um, the Alliance published our release three specs. Uh, that was uh, last January, so January of 20, supporting 5G operation, uh, 5G NR in the band. So we do support 5G. I would say from an equipment perspective, um, the 5G uh, chipsets really are you know, starting to come into the fore now, both on the infrastructure and the client side. As you mentioned, the, many of the operators have already said that whatever they deploy, um, if it's LTE today, it's got to have an upgrade path to 5G. Um, you know, I, I think Verizon and, uh, and, and AT&T have been very clear on that, as have um, some of the MSOs. Um, but uh, I would expect we'll see more 5G being deployed or more 5G equipment, I should say, coming into the band over the next year. Um, mm -hmm. I think for a lot of the private activity, um, you know, the LTE really, you know, meets the requirements for, I, I would probably say 90% plus of private yeah. employment. You know, yeah. those people are looking for, you know, really <laughs> low latency um, precision machine um, type applications, you know, they may wait for, for truly private 5G with non-standalone, uh, excuse me, with standalone um, yeah. options. Um, but, uh, but I expect the rest to probably move with LTE uh, deployments, that is for the private deployments in the short term. So I guess if I, yeah, if I would summarize in the short term, you're seeing a mix of 4G, mostly 4G and some 5G, but, but, but the CBRS will not stay like if you want outside of the of the you know 5G uh, ecosystem, and I guess it will be fully integrated as a 5G band cool. eventually. Well, it is. I mean, 3G PPR yeah. is N48, right? So I mean, we are a 5G yeah. NR band um, as we are an LTE band. Um, so yeah, absolutely, we'll be used for for both technologies. I think it's just a matter of you know. Um, again, I think the operators will move pretty aggressively to 5G. I think a number of private deployments will, will be 4G for some period of time, in my opinion. And I think just another question. There was a question about power limits. I know that in CBRS there were a lot of issues and some operators were not happy because of the limit on, on mm -hmm. the power. They said, it, such as T-Mobile, said it was not acceptable for, for mobile uh, deployment. But uh, uh, in real life, and, and I think there is an issue that some people are saying, let's increase the power limits. There shouldn't be any problem if we increase the power limits. But uh, uh, in your experience and based on your members, as, as that's a question we get via YouTube, uh, has real life world experience shown that power limits have been sufficient to protect against interference? Yeah, good, good, good question. And and you know the the questioner is absolutely right. There have been a number of requests to the FCC over the years to raise the power. So I mentioned Category B right now is capped at um, yeah. 50 watts or 47 dBm. 
Um, and and there have been different proposals by different entities to raise the the maximum power. Um, has it been effective? Have our limits been effective in protecting against interference? Yes. I mean, we've had we've had at this point zero reported cases of interference to the military system. So you know, we're very proud of that. You know, is there room for us to go back and work with the Navy to see, you know, um, if we're being overly protective? Yes, I would like to do that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe it's not just in power, maybe it's propagation and building entry and things like this that we could take back into consideration. Um, on the specific issue about whether we should have higher power, you know, category C or category D um, type mm -hmm. base stations, uh, I'll just say our, our alliance membership, it is very broad, it's very diverse, which is a strength, but um, but you'll get, you know, we've got 190 members, you'll probably get about 190 different opinions on whether higher power is a good thing. So okay. um, I don't expect the alliance itself will be taking a position on that issue. All right. Well, I think we're a bit over, so we'll have to leave it at that. But uh, thank you very much, Dave, for a very insightful presentation into uh, the Ongo Alliance and Shared Spectrum. And uh, you're free to feel free to join us for the rest of the conference. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Um, so I will introduce, I will start off the uh, next session, session three, technology and policy tools to increase uh, spectrum efficiency. What does the future hold? And uh, I think you'll hear a little bit more about CBRS and other types of uh, shared spectrum from uh, uh, our, our panel. We have a very distinguished uh, uh, panel. Uh, I'll just uh, go briefly uh, if I can get to the next chart. Um, we can see the next chart. The panel, in, in order of appearance, uh, is uh, Phil, Philip Marnik, a senior group director of Ofcom. I think almost needs no presentation. Uh, Mauro Martino, co-chair of the subgroup on spectrum sharing on RSPG, which I believe has just published an opinion on spectrum sharing. Stefan Zell, of, uh, chairman and CEO of Coliago Consulting, who I think will bring very definite views about some frameworks that have been put to, in place for spectrum sharing. Jennifer McCarthy will talk to us about uh, federated wireless uh, in uh, what I think federated wireless acts as a SaaS uh, spectrum access system, which Dave mentioned earlier. So you'll see that. And Ben Rolf will uh, is the CTO of the UWB Alliance, and and uh, will talk about how and they have numerous applications for <laughs> shared spectrum. So we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, but first, I'd like uh, just to give you. For those who don't know us, uh, one short introduction to LYA. Uh, we've been around uh, for more than 20 years and we provide a full suite of consulting services uh, to uh, uh, regulators and uh, operators, investors and private users. We, we bring extensive spectrum and auctions expertise. We do our own uh, auction uh, uh, platform software development and uh, we certainly uh, um, have uh, been very active in valuation and strategic reviews of uh, of investment. If I go to the next chart, um, some of the themes for our session, and, and they've been talked about in the previous session, I listened to uh, session two, policy and technological innovations to increase spectrum, spectrum efficiency, uh, dynamic spectrum allocation, white spaces, CBRS, six gigahertz, the role of sharing models, and, and I guess we'll talk about why these appear to be less popular in the EU compared to the US. Allocation approach to ensure that available bandwidth is used in most economically efficient method possible, and uh, I would add which parameters can be considered to promote sharing and efficiency, um, you know, frequency bands, geographical basis, spectrum cats and set aside, license term and renewal deployment requirements, use it or share it or use it and lease it, like was mentioned in session two earlier today, I think are all interesting uh, methods uh, or awarding spectrum on very small geographic basis, localized access. Certainly it's been done in, in, in the EU, but not in auction necessarily a uh, format. So we, we, can, we can talk about that. But before I, uh, we get to Phil Marnik, I just wanted also if I can go to the next slide. Um, all right, so private users in the, Dave talked about the CBRS auction. There's a little bit of detail here. These were actually auctioning 70 megahertz out of 150 for priority access licenses. So they were shared spectrum. It was a standard assigning clock auction format with a cap. So there was actually a 40 megahertz cap out of the 70 megahertz. 
with 10-year licenses using counties. So that's why there were 3,000 areas for which Spectrum was being assigned. And uh, after the auction, the, the auction was with generic blocks. And after the auction, the Spectrum blocks have been assigned using the Spectrum access system. So I just wanted to share with you some of the results for private, private users if we uh, look to the next, um, next slide. And hopefully you can read it, but here we've, some, we've given an idea of some results of private users who participated in the auction. There were more than you know, 200 or close to 300 uh, actually qualified bidders in the auction. And here you see you have a list of a number of, um, of private users who were winners. So some of them participated and ended up with nothing, but many did win. We have power companies, uh, we have uh, companies like Chevron, John Deere, um, which I believe was using, said they were using the spectrum for link, you know, private network applications for their own manufacturing plants. So a number of uh, electrical utilities and some universities and uh, you know, a varied group of, of users. And, and you see what, what uh, actually here as a summary of what they want. Um, in, in total, they, they won Spectrum in 179 counties, 400 licenses, on average close to 20 megahertz um, per each of the winners. So uh, that's uh, what was won. They, they spent $176 million out of the 4.6, so that's, uh, uh, you know, a lot of money for private users and, and a small percentage overall of the total auction proceeds uh, because it was like uh, not quite uh, 4%. And the average value that they paid. Um, as you can see, we've, we've highlighted in red those that pay well over um, the auction average. The auction average for the mobile operators for everyone was 20, close to 22 cents per megahertz pop. But we do have some some private users that ended up paying quite a lot more than that at 49 cents, 32 cents, or even 60 cents, while many of them paid very little, two, three, four cents, or 10 cents. So uh, there's a quite a variety of prices, but you can see that many uh, paid very little. I have to say that the opening bid in that auction was two cents per megahertz pop across the board, across in any, any county. So, uh, and, and you have some bidders that obviously uh, uh, scored uh, Spectrum at very low prices for private uh, usage. So with that as a background, I'd say let the discussion begin. And uh, can we bring our first speaker, uh, Philip Marnik from Ofcom. Good afternoon, everybody from a very sunny London. Thank you very much indeed for the introduction. I think in my short introduction, what I was going to do was outline some of the themes that we've said from our spectrum, recent spectrum strategy that we think are important in the sharing regime. We identified three areas which are actually really important for us to look at in a particular areas of focus for us. One is supporting wireless innovation. As we said in the CBRS presentation, there's lots and lots of new services that need to use wireless to enable digitization of the economy. So for us, it's actually making more time spending it with these industries, understanding their needs, making sure that we have the rules in place to help them do things instead of the rules that don't help them, supporting innovation, making spectrum available in places before we actually know the final use, but giving people certainty and help in trying to get there. Also for us is making sure the licensing regime fits, licensing that fit local and national services. So making sure we understand the needs of some of these businesses who want the protection of licenses, whether it's shared spectrum or dedicated spectrum in particular locations, and make sure we have all these options in place. The next one for us is also promoting sharing. We need to ensure, ensure we encourage more sharing. More spectrum can be shared, more people need it. To make this work, however, we need to make sure people are aware that neighbors, we understand the needs of both to try and do it. One of our challenges through time has been the overprotection of services. Everybody who's got existing use always wants more and more protection. How do we get it more realistic? How do we make it more more there? And one of the things for us is making sure we have better data, understanding what someone needs to enable them to protect it, put incentives in place to encourage receivers to get better, make things more resilient, make people realize that actually you can't just stop because you want to make sure you keep your own. So how do we get there? Getting the efficient balance between people, trying to make it work. I think in sharing, one of the things that we spoke about a lot 
is actually people have tried to think about the most complex ways of which you need to put things in place to enable sharing to work. Actually, we can share spectrum, we can issue local licenses, we can make this thing available now so that people can use it, and we can bring in the technical capabilities that deal with vast quantities of people needing it in the future as we, as we find and evolve, use it. So for us, we have got some DSA in place, we have used TV white spaces, we are looking at different ways and we can make it work. We are trying to innovate to try and make spectrum available for people. We've already released bands in, mo in mobile spectrum bands where 3GB technology is already available. And then people are using that, whether it's 2.3 gigahertz, 1800 megahertz, or actually our 38242 band, of which is available right across the country for people to use for both medium and low power, as well as the 26 gigahertz band, for which you've made ability available for in-building usage. But one of the other bands we're looking at is actually six gigahertz. We've already made the lower part of the six gigahertz band available for Wi-Fi or license exempt usage. Wi-Fi is a generic term. But actually other parts of the world have made the, another part of the band also available. So there's an ecosystem developing of the Wi-Fi chipsets that can be used. We know that this band people are talking about using for mobile, but, but before WRC 15, people looked at this band. We know what's in there. In the UK, we've got satellites. The satellites providing the C band, so it's the receivers on the satellites. We know we've got fixed links in the band, and quite a lot of them right across the UK in various places. And actually, we've been moving more links in there as some of the other bands we've cleared at, say, 1400, where people have low bandwidth use of moving it. We've also got some uh, radio astronomy in there as well. And it's because it's one of the central frequencies that people are using to monitor. And it's one of those frequencies that actually you need for this purpose. So we understand the challenges of making this available for high power. And I'm sure the WRC discussion will be interesting. And I'm sure actually it's not a technical one because we all know what can and can't work there. It's a policy decision we've got to think about. But at the moment, actually I've got a band of spectrum of which I can use for other purposes. I've got an ecosystem that's been developed for Wi-Fi. So one of the options I'm currently looking at and we're currently considering is whether actually we make this spectrum available for a local license use to enable people to use the chipsets and the devices that are currently emerging to enable this band of the upper six gigahertz band to be used for that purpose. So for us, when, on our duties is always looking at the efficient use of spectrum. We need to think about how we put all spectrum into use to make it work so we can support existing services, specialist services, and new sharing applications they go through, and how do we continue to support innovation? Thank you very much indeed. I look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Philip, and uh, that's uh, very interesting, and I'm sure we'll talk about the success of your local uh, access uh, uh, framework uh, shortly. Uh, but may I bring up the second speaker, uh, Mauro, who will talk to us from RSPG, certainly Mauro Martino, also from Italy and RSPG, who will uh, uh, bring us to, up to speed, I guess, on, on what the RSPG is thinking of the subject of uh, shared spectrum. Sure. Uh, uh, thank you, Joan. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Thank you for, uh, very much for inviting me to give a few words here in this annual conference. Uh, and I'll give you some views on spectrum sharing from the RSPG perspective and actually from a national regulator, uh, that's Agigom uh, Italy. As you know, RSPG was active in tackling the issue of spectrum sharing. It was included in its last work program and a specific working group was created, chaired by me and a colleague from Spain. We provided for two deliverables. One is a report that was published in February this year, and one is an opinion that was just approved a few days ago after public consultation and is going to be published uh, probably uh, tomorrow. Coming to this opinion, I want to go into details. You can read the text in a while, just a few highlights. And main concept, we basically said that we should consider and try to apply all technologies, approaches, and best practices that we have investigated. A guiding, a guiding principle for all spectrum regulators could um, so be the principle of UC or Sherit. That means that uh, from the beginning, either when we grant new rights of use or when we renew rights of use, or for unlicensed, unlicensed bands when we prepare the technical regulation, we should think of the possibility to share the bands. It's important to highlight that roaming and all technical related forms, 
uh, network slicing, in general access, can be considered uh, forms of spectrum sharing or complementary elements to spectrum sharing. So those should be also seen and eventually authorized with the same approach. We regulators have three basic means to achieve more sharing in licensed bands. First, by regulation, by imposing rules at the first grant of rights of use or in the course of operations. Second, by fostering voluntary agreements. And third, by incentivizing specific commitments. We want to exploit all the three. The first is more difficult, not only for the natural resistance of traditional players, but also because we should be, be very clever in devising the right measures well in advance of a process that may last 15 to, to 20 years. We need a very good crystal ball. The second apparently could be easier. Uh, we are experiencing many agreements recently. However, those agreements are not necessarily less conflictual. Actually, uh, here the conflicts arise not from the players, but from the competitors. The third one is the easiest. You put down money for a given objective, but mind that incentives are a two-sided blade. Once announced, they may cause a stop or a diversion of already planned spontaneous investments. So you end up in paying for nothing. Anyway, those are now being considered with the national recovery and resilience plans all over Europe. Coming back to the opinion, uh, also demand and needs from vertical industry should be considered. We have uh, heard a lot uh, of that today. Verticals are the new actor on the stage in this period. For this scenario, consideration can also be in the form of a complementary measure to spectrum sharing, such as leasing. The leasing is a very akin to sharing and uh, at least to some form of forms of sharing. For example, geographical intra-service single tier sharing. For verticals, this may become micro-leasing and a simplified authorization procedure could be considered as well. One other interesting point that we deem important to strengthen is trust and conf confidence between all users and involved parties. This I feel is particular, particularly important. Uh, it means it is valuable to develop some proof of concept systems with advanced solutions so to be instrumental in gaining trust and confidence. It could also be beneficial to issue innovation and trial licenses to allow non-traditional users, such as uh, vertical users, actually, or industry users in general, the possibility to get access to spectrum. In particular, those trials could also employ in future artificial intelligence functional blocks. And also it would be useful to develop some examples of automated platforms for the authorization uh, process in a light licensing framework regime. Light licensing is very promising in a sharing scenario where some access limitations, limitations are not based on the user characteristics, but on the availability of an electromagnetic space. And in those platforms, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and blockchain or DLT uh, technology can play some role. Okay, so uh, fi some final wording on the main challenges uh, we have to deal with in the process of improving the spectrum sharing. First, uh, uh, the issue of which approach to use for a band, licensed or unlicensed, I mean. This because, of course, the sharing approaches are different. For bands uh, already assigned, even if willing, we cannot change the rules. Either uh, there are already sharing obligations or not. This is the code. Uh, the European code. From the one side, it says that we should be flexible and promote innovation. From the other side, from the other, it says in practice to assign bands for 20 years. Once done, it is difficult to intervene later. We may make targeted changes, of course, but lawyers are always more powerful than engineers. There are scenarios where we can intervene. Scenarios with licensed incumbents that can uh, share with licensed or unlicensed newcomers. And those are the bands where we would like to act and are well known. So in this sense, we don't want to change the usual policy framework we have today, based on EU ECC work and ITU WRC uh, work. Uh, one, issue, one issue that is always raised in our job is that one size uh, doesn't fit all, body, all bodies. So every situation is different and should be treated differently. This doesn't mean that we should not try to achieve harmonization and more coordination at EU level, as we currently do. However, with the increasing possibility 
possibilities of sharing, the risk of national solutions increases. And this also means fragmenting a spectrum and putting burden on national regulators. Finally, some issues for a longer term. Some are actually matter for 6G, which is started being sketched at the moment. And by the way, the Commission has just launched the Smart Networks and Services Joint Undertaking as the first big 6G initiative. And uh, those are all um, the problems deriving from the use of algorithms for decisions having effect on, on the persons and their assets. So I just name here the legal status of automated contracts or author authorizations, quality of service deriving from uh, artificial intelligence functional blocks, net neutrality of an internet, and the issue of uh, the right of appeal, appeal against automated decisions, I mean. All these aspects should be rather clear before going into commercial use. Concluding from theory to practice, there are some issues to deal with. Not everything that appears good and just can be done in practice. However, it is important that we regulators have put this issue of spectrum sharing in an opinion, not only in this dedicated to sharing, but also in another one on the policy program. This would surely help every actor involved to raise the awareness and act to improve the scenery. And I am confident uh, on that for uh, the future. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, uh, uh, Mauro. Uh, that was uh, quite interesting. And uh, we look forward to maybe uh, asking your opinion later on on, on some of these uh, award processes uh, for sharing. Uh, may I bring uh, the next speaker, Stefan Zell of Coliago mm -hmm. Consulting, who will uh, give us his opinion on some sharing models. Hello. Uh, thank you for inviting me to the session. Uh, actually, I'll talk a little bit uh, not so much about sharing, but uh, go back to first principle of spectrum efficiency. Uh, this is, after all, what this session is about. So the first slide, please. Um, so why do we talk about efficiency? It is because spectrum is a scarce resource. I think this is uh, more than apparent in this conference uh, because different users always want more spectrum. And there are two aspects to efficient use of spectrum. One, economic, and the other, technical. So economic efficiency, that really relates to maximizing the outputs or the socioeconomic benefits of spectrum. Uh, and the technical efficiency, you could uh, relate to employing the technologies that the, allow the most data to be transmitted, or we could simply measure it as spectral efficiency, uh, bits per hertz, and there are a few other aspects to that. Next slide, please. So looking at economic efficiency, uh, first of all, uh, there is the allocative efficiency. In other words, allocating spectrum uh, to its highest use. And this could be a permanent allocation in form of a license, say 15, 20, or definite license. And generally, uh, market-based spectrum assignment uh, within the constraints of harmonization are deemed to be more efficient um, because it corresponds uh, to identifying what is in fact the, the best or the use that produces the highest value. Um, then uh, that the use of spectrum is maximized with the lowest possible resource co cost. And here we have things such as spectrum sharing, spectrum pooling, network sharing, uh, technology and service mutual, uh, defragmentation, et cetera, all of, all of these things. And they really do provide a bit of a checklist when uh, spectrum is being assigned or the rules are being uh, drawn up. And the last one is the dynamic efficiency. In other words, that these two uh, points I talked about remain true over time, because over a 20-year license, stuff changes, technology advances. So uh, dealing with that through a monitoring usage, encourage spectrum trading and so on uh, can be helpful. Um, so ensuring both economic and dynamic efficiency uh, require continual innovation and investment and the markets evolve over time. And that is really a challenge also for regulators. Long licenses on the one hand, and yet being flexible respond to changing 
market and technology conditions. Next slide, please. The technical efficiency is really uh, all about bits per hertz, and this is all about allowing the latest technology to be deployed, or at least to deploy it as quickly as possible. Uh, this is also part of the uh, IT in the ITU constitution. Uh, there's this uh, paragraph that members shall endeavor to limit the number of frequencies at the spectrum uh, to the minimum of essential. So, in other words, don't waste it. Uh, to that end, they shall endeavor to apply the latest technology advances as soon as possible. So, practice uh, this means technology neutrality, but also perhaps even encouraging uh, the migration to spectrally more efficient uh, technologies such as 5G. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, spectrum trading is, of course, a good way of uh, responding to change circumstances, as are subordinated spectrum licenses. We heard a, a little bit about this in this conference. In fact, in Canada, as one of the countries where you have had subordinated spectrum licenses for some time. And in particular, this allows uh, larger MNOs who are not using the spectrum in some of the very remote rural parts of Canada to subordinate the licenses uh, to uh, specialized rural operators who would deploy it there. Uh, so this, this is just an example, which may be specific to Canada because uh, Canada is largely empty. Uh, from a geographic perspective, but maybe not so useful in Europe, but I think it could be looked at uh, for a number of countries with a larger surface area. Uh, next slide, please. Um, now, there are these principles, such as technology and service neutrality, but we also have to look at this in the context of reality. And 5G is largely implemented using TDD, for example, 3.4 to 3.8. Um, so you need uh, synchronization between networks, or you have to have a 30 megahertz wide guard band. So that's really the difference between TDD and FTD. Uh, in practice, this means uh, that all operators have to synchronize, otherwise you'd waste spectrum. But the implication is that operators cannot flexibly respond to market demands as they see it. So there is a bit of a problem there which needs to be addressed. And that problem uh, has also been highlighted in the context of verticals. Uh, because clearly, uh, the doing exactly what they want in their bit of spectrum is essential to the whole verticals case. Uh, so having talked about these principles, I just like to take a quick look at the uh, what has been done in Germany in, in 3.4 to 3.8. Next slide, please. So a feature of the German auction, and this has been commented on uh, also by uh, T-Mobile earlier today, uh, uh, Jan Hendrik Jochum gave us um, some of the arguments uh, uh, that affect uh, the mobile operators. So only 300 megahertz is available because 100 megahertz was set aside for vertical operators. And who holds that set aside spectrum? Well, there is a little bit of a list you can find for those who agreed to publish it, but no other information is really available. It's considered a business secret, so we don't know. So some questions then with regards to efficiency of that 100 megahertz set aside. If verticals do not have to bid for spectrum, how do we know that how they value the spectrum and that they value it more than mobile operators? If information is not publicly available, how do we scrutinize actual use and know that it is used efficiently over time? If verticals have to synchronize with MNOs, then it doesn't really make sense uh, to have that set aside. So uh, this was also came up earlier on the conference and synchronization so far isn't a problem because there are so few of those around. But uh, if synchronizing, or if uh, there are uh, more of these networks deployed, then certainly only 70 megahertz of the 100 set aside would be useful. So that's a waste of 30% of the set aside spectrum. Um, 
you know, that MNOs paid a very high price as an efficient rather than spending it on deployment. And lastly, the four MNOs cannot deploy all in a 100 megahertz wise band, which again is inefficient. So these are just a few questions which uh, regulators might want to consider when looking at a set aside or verticals decision in the context of issue efficiency. Thank you very much. That ends my presentation. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, we have uh, two more speakers. Uh, and uh, before, actually, I will address that empty country comment in, in when we start the panel. So um, uh, Jennifer McCarthy of uh, Federated Wireless, uh, please take the floor and explain to us why SAS are such great systems. Thank you, Joanne, and thank you to the uh, Forum Europe team for organizing this wonderful conference yet again. Really appreciate the invitation uh, and the ability to be here with you all virtually. Um, uh, as Joanne mentioned, I'm Jennifer McCarthy with Federated Wireless. We are one of the commercial spectrum access system administrators for the CBRS band in the United States. And we are also a prospective automated frequency coordinator for the six gigahertz band in the US, hopefully in Canada, uh, as well as other countries that are looking to uh, allow new unlicensed devices uh, into the six gigahertz band and want to take advantage of the uh, ability to use higher powers and operate outdoors um, uh, through coordination that the AFC can can provide as well as ensuring protection uh, for incumbents should uh, any uh, unforeseen um, interference actually occur. Now, I know that the uh, presentation or the topic of this particular um, panel is about spectrum efficiency and how technology and policy can work together to make that happen. And uh, what I'd like to focus on is the um, uh, technology and the automation that uh, that we've brought to bear in the CBRS context and how uh, all of uh, what was originally set up as a uh, system for enabling uh, sharing and more efficient use of uh, military spectrum uh, between military and commercial sharing between military and commercial users how that technology is actually achieving many of the things um, that Stefan and others uh, have been bringing up in terms of, of challenges uh, to maximize spectrum access and make truly efficient use uh, out of various bands. So um, as you all know, in the United States, we have an itinerant user, the US military, uh, that has access to the 3.5 gigahertz band um, as its uh, primary use for radar. Um, and there are a no, have been a number of commercial systems that are more fixed that we're able to share with the military in areas where uh, geographic areas where the military wasn't operating. And through the CBRS sharing framework and the automated dynamic spectrum uh, sharing access system that we've implemented, um, we've been able to make much more efficient use out of the out of the military spectrum while ensuring protection uh, for their operations when and where they need them. But as I mentioned, this same spectrum access system, the dynamic sharing model has actually increased efficiency from a, a wide variety of, of, of other, um, uh, for uh, other purposes. Um, not only uh, making, you know, increasing efficiency by uh, maximizing the amount of megahertz uh, that can be uh, put to use, but it's also increasing efficiency by enabling um, a wide diverse array of other users to be able to access spectrum for the first time. And we've had a lot of discussion, various um, uh, uh, other panels about private networks um, and private network users, enterprises, verticals, whatever you wanna call them, who are now able to access uh, spectrum, whether on a licensed basis or a lightly licensed basis, uh, and that sharing is enabled through the, the automated sharing capability. But in addition, um, we're also um, being making more efficient um, leasing and secondary market opportunities through the use of the SaaS. Uh, we are going to be launching, uh, now that the PALs are operational, uh, here in the next few months, a spectrum marketplace that will enable people to go to um, uh, our, our website and look and see what spectrum is available from licensed users 
uh, who want to lease their leftover spectrum and enable people to sort of like Airbnb, Airbnb have a, a real time um, transaction uh, to make uh, uh, that spectrum available for new uses, new users and new use cases um, on a leased basis. So we're very excited about being able to do that. And again, that real time capability of leasing um, is going to be made available through the spectrum um, access system that, again, was originally designed for other purposes. Um, Synchronization amongst the uh, different um, network networks and network use cases is going to be implemented and enabled through uh, the Spectrum Access System as well, and will allow for different uh, types of frame structures depending on what uh, the users in a particular geographic area um, are, what they need, and uh, we are using an industry-wide agreement on how that should be implemented by the SAS. Um, so it uh, avoids having the regulator have to pick one uh, frame structure and uh, force it uh, on, on everybody. And in this way, we think will allow for more um, efficient use of different, uh, different frame structures by different incumbent users. Um, and then finally, one of the other uh, major uh, uh, efficiency benefits we think that the automated capability brings to the table is rather than having to manually um, uh, either apply for a local license um, or have the regulator have to deal with uh, at each of these applications one at a time on a manual basis, um, we can start using this automated capability to um, allow new users access to Spectrum in their particular uh, geographic area, whether or not that is, you know, meets the definition that some regulators are, are currently using uh, to apply local licensing conditions. This can be much more flexible. It's based on bright line tests of, of interference amongst, uh, you know, avoiding interference amongst different users. And it can be optimized using um, the automated uh, spectrum sharing uh, technology and capability. And we think that this automation is going to provide um, greater certainty uh, more uh, real-time uh, spectrum access uh, decisions will drive uh, greater innovation and ultimately uh, make more efficient use out of the spectrum. Um, so we look forward to uh, working with regulators around the world on how they can implement aspects of this technology capability to improve the local licensing approaches that they're now uh, considering and starting to implement uh, for uh, verticals and other uh, private uh, private network use cases, as well as, um, as, as MNOs who want to make more efficient use out of their spectrum. Uh, we think that there may be applications for this technology there as well. So thank you, Joanne. I look forward to the, uh, the ongoing conversation. Thank you, Jennifer. That was quite uh, interesting. And I know that we already have quite a few questions. But before we get to the panel, uh, Jim Rolf, uh, Chief Technology Officer of uh, the uh, Offer White Band Alliance, uh, will talk to us about the myriads of applications they do for uh, spectrum sharing. Ben? Good, good morning and good afternoon and good evening, everyone, wherever you happen to be. Um, thank you for having us here. Uh, this has been an interesting discussion so far. Um, go ahead and uh, go on to the to the sli next slide, please. So uh, this is just a quick introduction to who we are. We're uh, an industry alliance um, like that ha was created to support the UWB industry in 2018 um, <clears throat> uh, by by a couple of us who've been deeply involved in the industry for quite some time. Um, and this gives you kind of an overview of uh, of where we are now. Um, we are very uh, focused on sharing as a critical uh, aspect of the future. Um, we see this as being perhaps the most important me mechanism to getting more value out of spectrum. Um, and we work with a lot of other organizations uh, as contributors, uh, as co collaborators, um, and so forth in order to, to, to uh, work toward these goals. Next, please. Um, this is just a quick snapshot of why, uh, you know, why the, the alliance was really founded, because this is a, an area of the market that has been exploding. Um, and we could see this uh, happening with the development of new standard um, and the widespread adoption of that standard. And so this is just giving you a snapshot. This is a uh, forecast to be over a billion devices in the field by the end of the year with about a billion a year being added in the near future. So that's a that's a lot of stuff. And if you go on to the next slide, 
you see that there's a wide variety of applications that we're finding ourselves in. And there's an interesting, even though these are very diverse applications, there's a really interesting common feature in almost all of these applications that we're seeing explosive growth. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see what it is. Uh, almost nothing is done with a single radio technology today. Most of the really interesting applications and a lot of the innovation happening today is in how to combine the right uh, multiple technologies uh, in, in an e effective way. And this is one of the keys to efficiency. We've, we've heard a lot of different definitions of efficiency already this morning. Um, and if you kind of look at what, from our perspective, we see some of the key measures of efficiency really are uh, how many users can you support in a given spectrum and space? Uh, so it's it's not just bits per, per uh, second per megahertz, but bits per second per megahertz per cubic meter, number of users per cubic meter, and the diversity of use. And for this, sharing is critical. The ability of all of these different things to get along and work together is going to be key to the future. And we're already seeing it in our industry. Um, there really is uh, there really is no picking one or the other. This is this is the the reality now is that we're seeing most most high volume devices have many radios in them, and uh, application developers are learning how to use those in concert. So if you go to the next slide, um, oh yeah, this is just a little yeah. Go ahead and go to the end here. So this is just a little bit. Um, one of the things we've we've heard a, a lot about the dynamic spectrum uh, allocation approach, which I think is an extremely powerful tool and one that we're going to see becoming more and more important in the future as well. But there are lots of different kinds of sharing. And UWB is one of the earliest ways that we found to share spectrum amongst licensed and unlicensed users. Uh, and if you, you kind of look at the, this slide is showing you one of the reasons why it works. If you look at the typical uh, signals that are used by those licensed users and other, and also other unlicensed users, they tend to be, um, uh, by our perspective, of uh, fairly high power and continuous carrier systems. UWB uh, and most of those, uh, all of those applications on the pre previous slides have really been uh, impulse radio UWB. That's that's where the real focus is. The industry is today. And it's very low power down at or, or below the unintentional emissions limit of most domains. And it's impulses that are spread out really in time. So the signal duty cycle is very low. And that means there's a lot of gaps. This means that in many cases, we can have a communication link that's also doing precise location. And we're talking, and we've got uh, members that are, that are doing down below uh, a centimeter in some cases, accuracy. Uh, with and this is instantaneous so the dynamics are very good so this enables a lot of applications that that other uh, technologies really can't support and this is why we're seeing it being used in conjunction using the impulse radio for what it is uniquely capable of using other technologies that are established and already available in the device to do things that they do well like rapid association uh moving large volumes of data and things like that so it's a very complementary system and one that can can share spectrum by the nature of the signal. And so I think looking at the various different ways of, of um, providing sharing, and uh, we, we and our members are very interested in, in the dynamic spectrum sharing model. We see that as being key to the future, but we also see it, a, a lot of opportunity for innovation in what we call uh, natural coexistence, um, as well as coordinated coexistence that's done independently um, of a centralized uh, control. But adaptive coexistence is a term that I use for that. Um, and these are all going to be important. Uh, again, different applications and different scenarios will have different um, different needs. And, and this is, comes back to a to the different ways of measuring efficiency. And I think something that we have heard touched on already that's really important is that um, flexibility and diversity of use is a very important metric for spectrum efficiency. How many different ways can we use the same piece of spectrum? And that's where innovation really helps us out. So that's uh, that's kind of who we are and where we're coming from. Um, and again, you know, for us, uh, sharing is a natural thing we've been doing since the beginning of our industry, and we we see this as being absolutely critical to the to the future. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, that was quite interesting. Uh, I know there's more and more devices that use uh, uh, the, these frequencies for spectrum sharing. So uh, we, we'll talk about that uh, in, more in our panel, uh, which are now all up on the screen. Hopefully everyone can see us. We have about 20 minutes for a lively discussion. So uh, maybe I can start off uh, off the bat uh, just addressing this uh, question of the empty country where I come from. Um, uh, I'd say Canada is not that empty. Uh, there's a fair amount of <laughs> density. Um, and uh, on the question of subordinate license, if I might, because you uh, definitely peep me. So um, it's been around for a while, the subordinate licensing, and people say you need to do that to make sure that spectrum is efficiently used in lice in rural areas and all that. It's been around for a long time in the US as well. I think in practice, there's not a lot of, uh, of uh, actually, uh, no, I I examples of, of good subordinate licensing. Um, I think it's, even though it's been around for a long time, it's, it's not really, you know, carriers are not that open to doing subordinate licensing. Uh, I, I certainly agree with the spectrum trading, but I would say that one way to stimulate that is uh, even though you have large area for licensing, you can have like conditions of license that talk that you should have uh, within five years deployment or maybe no. you don't have yeah. deployment, then you have subordinate yeah. licensing. So I think that's one way of doing that. And, um, and I think oh, that's yeah. good to, to take hold. Oh, yeah. Good point. So if we want to go um, to, to the question, some of the questions of the teams were this, um, the role of sharing model, and, and if I can just start off with that before we get to some of the questions from the audience, why are, are the sharing models, uh, such as the ones that were presented by uh, Dave Wright and Jennifer, less less popular among you, are not popular at all at the moment, I would say. Uh, compared to the U.S., uh, can anybody, uh, Phil and Moral, you, would you like to uh, touch base on that? Is it a question of timing, or is it a question of usage? Or what are the issues here, or if there are any issues? I'm happy to try and address some of that. I think, I mean, the U.S. CBRS is a solution to a problem. The problem in the U.S. was there was warships going up the coast and there's military radars, and therefore you need a system that enables you to identify when those need the spectrum and be able to therefore make it available to others. That's a different model in other places. I don't have that problem in the UK and some of the bands. We have a problem where what you're trying to do is enable people to have access to spectrum and give them the conditions of use at the particular point they need it. And I think it's really key that you use the right solution for the right problem. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the most important thing. Because Mario, Mario said, there's no one size fits all. It's what is the problem and what is the right solution to enable people to access spectrum in an efficient and effective way, get what they need to use where they need it. So I think it's not a problem of we don't use something, that they use something. It's we don't have the same problem, but we have different problems, and therefore we need different solutions. Okay. Uh, Mauro, would you like to pitch in on this? Or? Yes, I can, I can take on uh, this, uh, this issue. Uh, well, what, one, one thing is... Uh, the, the usual attitude we we have in uh, in EU and in particularly in countries in South uh, European countries that we are more concerned with the legal legal uh, stability. Uh, we may may seem uh, overprotective. And we want to uh, avoid uh, uh, we preventing uh, interference uh, rather than uh, trying to. Uh, uh, leave the uh, enterprise to uh, experiment and then uh, try to solve uh, uh, later some uh, small problems. So this is a, a cultural uh, attitude that we we have. Uh, maybe in, in some cases it, it is a better one and in other uh, it's better the, uh, the other. I want uh, also to, to um, dig a bit on a, another question that uh, uh, regarding um, uh, why? Why is not time to to check uh, the use of the current uh, current uh, to improve efficiency in the current bands rather than uh, uh, trying to exploit uh, uh, more and more new bands? Well, I think that both should be pursued. I mean, the, the existing bands have been assigned mostly in in the traditional traditional MNOs. 
uh, mostly uh, through uh, auctions that have uh, achieved, uh, at least uh, from uh, an allocation, an, an assignment point of view, some uh, economic efficiency as well. At least uh, the opportunity cost has been repaid. New banks uh, would uh, benefit of new technology advances and uh, are, um, I think, uh, uh, will be assigned probably in, uh, in, uh, with uh, um, native sharing uh, obligations. I mentioned this point uh, in my initial uh, um, speech. And uh, uh, in some bands, uh, we, all, we only have uh, uh, a license to use. It would, uh, this would, uh, would uh, um, pressure, competitive pressure to existing MLOs to respond to uh, this new uh, um, technology possibilities we would have in the new uh, bands, the, the bands that are uh, identified for the future, six upper 60 gigahertz, 26, 42, 60, and tera, and tera hertz, uh, bands, and so on. So uh, I think that MNOs have uh, a, a short window of opportunity to react uh, right now. Uh, they, they have a, a unique position to exploit their, uh, their uh, let's say, the served bands, the well-paid bands, uh, to uh, respond to these uh, uh, new challenges for, for, for new players. Uh, but they, um, they should consider uh, something. They, they, they should try to uh, um, uh, be more keen on agreements with the new players, with the in industri industrial players. They should uh, agree, they should make agreements with the service providers, new actors in the value chain, asset providers, and uh, try to uh, uh, avoid the paradigm, the paradigm uh, of uh, the customer is mine and I want to handle it uh, on, my, on, uh, on my own. So, uh, if this happens, uh, we will see uh, a development of efficiency uh, both in uh, existing bands and uh, in new bands. Would uh, anybody mm -hmm. care to comment on this? Uh, Jennifer, Stefan, or Benjamin, um, you want to add to, to these comments on, on uh, uh, MNOs being uh, proactive to sharing? Um, mm -hmm. Anybody has some comments on this? Or? Could I? Is that possible? Yes, absolutely. Because <laughs> I think it's sort of um, it's a different question whether MNOs are proactive to sharing or not. Because what, as Jennifer was saying about CBRS and others, this is a different spectrum. It's spectrum that's available to all on various terms. I mean, your things about subordinate use in the UK, we've said in various places that mo we will license mobile spectrum at mob for mobile that mobile operators have and run in auctions in places where using on a short-term basis for three years and some others so there's lots of different ways in which you can do it to facilitate it but actually that's mostly remote rural what we're talking about now is mostly applications which are industrial mm -hmm. and the mobile industry talks about verticals what we mean is most of the rest of the economy yeah. and actually they are in places where people need it and where the mobile operators demanding it so you might find a bit of extra spectrum amongst what they're not using but it's the probability is low what you yeah. therefore find spectrum that actually can be used for that purpose and enable it to be used. I think this is the big challenge of trying to make it sort of viable in place it needs to be. So if I might, add, Jennifer, please go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, so I know we were talking earlier about whether or not Canada is empty and then <laughs> talking about whether or not um, industrial applications are in the same place that people are. I think we've got a mixture of this in the United States, right? We've got some empty places where there are a few people and we're trying to find ways of um, increasing broadband reach to those people who are in more remote areas. Um, and we've got a lot of industrial that's also fairly um, remote and but needs access to spectrum. And then you've got those dense areas, right, where you've got uh, competing interest for um, outdoor wide area public mobile networks. And you've got folks who are probably going to be needing um, access indoors. And can we make more efficient use of the same spectrum um, if, uh, 
you know, in building penetration creates the separate, you know, or we've got enough separation between those two that we've got some frequency reuse capabilities. And, you know, it's been our experience um, with, uh, you know, administering the spectrum access system in CBRS that yes, we can actually have more than one user on the same spectrum in the same geographic area uh, through frequency reuse and automating that capability. And so that's, you know, even, um, you know, another reason for demonstrating that, you know, this automated capability can really squeeze every megahertz, uh, you know, out of out of the system rather than necessarily doing a first come first serve or only one at a time in a particular geographic location. Okay. Um, anybody else want to comment on this or? Sure. I'd like to kind of add on to what, what Jennifer said, because um, uh, reuse is, of course, very, very important. And, and, and I kind of touched on that. And I think, you know, 20, uh, 15 to 20 years ago, uh, uh, I found myself in the position of advocating in, in, in various industries the importance of spectrum efficiency being measured in more than just bits per second per megahertz. Uh, moving more bits is, of course, uh, something that we're always striving to do better, but it's only one of many millions of applications and many, many, many applications uh, aren't looking to move gigabits per second on a regular basis, but they're looking to get very high spectral reuse. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of different ways to achieve that. I think uh, Jennifer's uh, focused on a coordination approach, but um, one of the fundamental assumptions in that approach has been up to this point that you need to essentially avoid certain um, co-occupancy situations for, for the most part. So it's you know one or the other. And one of the things that we're finding is that a very powerful tool for sharing is when you have technologies that can coexist simultaneously, and in many cases, simultaneously operate. For example, we see uh, many of our member systems will be able to transmit and receive directly underneath other techno radio technologies while they're operating. And this is an area where I see a lot of, of opportunity for further innovation. Um, and it's just one of the, the things I meant by the many ways of sharing. And uh, I don't think that there's any one that's going to supplant the other. I think these all have to work together. And of course, we're also very interested in the in the CBRS type of dynamic spectrum model, which, uh, as Philip noted, was 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 uh, initiated to solve a particular problem, but now is being applied in concept much much more broadly. We're seeing it as a key to uh, efficient use of the new unlicensed six gigahertz stuff. And we're very much involved in, in, in uh, you know, following that and, and helping to make sure that what emerges from that is usable by a, a wide variety of spectrum users. Uh, and so I think that's something to, to keep in mind that we're always looking to balance uh, the various ways in which we can use spectrum and, and that diversity of use is becoming increasingly important. I think we're going to see a lot of growth in that need moving forward. Thank you, Ben. If I might want to, I know we have about seven minutes left. I'd like to get maybe to some of the other questions from, from the uh, participants, uh, the attendees. Uh, there's a question from uh, Paulo Ricardo on, on, could the panelists please give their opinion on the future of TV white spaces? Is now the time to have a real and sustainable focus on achieving the potential of TV white spaces? I mean, a few years ago in conferences, it was more like t white spaces were dead. Uh, so uh, is, uh, can we speak to uh, what's happening in the white space, which certainly was, uh, you know, one of the first uh, incarnation, if you want, of a, a large scheme for spectrum sharing. So uh, anybody want to take that one out? Uh, then, yes. Well, uh, uh, one thing. So, cause I was also very, uh, very involved in that early on as well, because of again the opportunity there to to reuse spectrum in various ways. I think one of the the, the limitations that we came up against was the uncertainty in spectrum availability, uh, and there were a lot of factors that worked into that. But from a commercial point of view, it just became uh, very difficult to convince people to invest when there was no, uh, the perception was that there was no guarantee there would be any uh, channels available at a given time. And um, a lot of that was, I think, a perception problem more than a technical problem. But that's one of the things that I see as being very different now. We've got a much more evolved uh, way of doing the, the centralized management aspect of it. 
And we're seeing with, for example, CBRS and what's going on and in, in being proposed for the six gigahertz sharing. Uh, I think uh, that that uncertainty issue is being addressed very well. And that I think will really enable us to go back and look at all kinds of shared spectrum a lot of the rules and maybe apply what has been learned to make some of that available again. Jennifer. So, and I, and I would also argue that the ecosystem for equipment in the TV white spaces has not matured and developed in the way that was necessary to make that as successful as, um, say, the CBRS fans ecosystem that Dave Wright spoke about earlier, um, you know, really is. And so that's a combination of factors. You know, um, uh, the, the fact that, um, you know, the band was identified for IMT, uh, you know, a long time ago and that Europe had been uh, developing, the CBRS band anyway, had been developing an ecosystem um, around LTE and ultimately 5G for that band. The fact that changes to the equipment were not necessary to implement the sharing in CBRS and that all we were doing was having a simple, uh, you know, API and face with the, with the equipment rather than actually having the equipment to necessary, you know, to change its, its functionality. Um, you know, there are a variety of issues that led to that ecosystem, um, you know, uh, problems. Um, and I think that's why it's also important to, to think about how to spur the, the equipment ecosystem to make sure that sharing is um, as successful as possible. Um, yes, please go ahead. No, I was agreeing. Yeah. And I think, again, that gets back to the, the encouraging investment. And, and one of the barriers to investment was the uncertainty. And I think uh, we've got a lot of experience now to show that it can work, and that helps quite a lot. That now it feeds back into the the investment uh, risk is now much more uh, well understood, and now that that leads to the equipment uh, development because you can't do that without the investment. So, so it's, all right, thank it's you. If sure. we go back to to <laughs> issues related to uh, sharing and European regulators, we have a question for Martin Rotter. Are European regulators more worried about the potential negative impacts of some forms of sharing on competition? So, and I guess, Stefan, you kind of indirectly talked about that in your presentation, but Phil and Mauro, uh, you see that uh, spectrum sharing could lead to lower competition or more competition, maybe. Can yeah. I get your opinion on that? Well, if we uh, roll back several years, uh, regulators didn't even allow infrastructure sharing because uh, competition and network was precisely building out the network. This is what brought this uh, really, really good uh, model coverage through private investment. And then we had passive sharing and now we have active sharing. Um, but yes, uh, I think there is uh, a bit of a competition concern there. Uh, how, how is that? Sorry, uh, we're... Yeah. Uh, how we can balance that, we are not quite sure, but certainly I think we have uh, the notion of competition is moving away from coverage towards away quality of service. Coverage towards quality of we service. We have some, some noise on the or something. Uh, some feedback there. Yeah. Oh, that's better. Okay, so competition is moving to quality of service and certainly when we do spectrum valuation, the value of spectrum is very much driven by uh, operator A having more spectrum than operator B, which at an equal investment uh, allows them to deliver a, a bigger quality of service and capture uh, a higher market share. So yeah, it is a problem uh, sharing. Tomorrow, you'd like to uh, add yeah, to that? I, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not uh, at all concerned on uh, on the possibility of sharing and and more sharing. W one thing should be clear that uh, that uh, we cannot uh, um, make a, um, a, a set of a, I mean authorization uh, by default. We should assess any any case at at uh, at hand. First, we should uh, assess uh, whether, uh, uh, as I said in my initial speech, whether uh, some rules uh, 
uh, can prevent uh, uh, sharing uh, from the beginning. Because uh, if we had assigned uh, uh, 20 years ago or 10 years ago spectrum uh, uh, without the possibility of cooling the spectrum, uh, then we cannot authorize uh, spectrum sharing with spectrum cooling, for, uh, for example, and so on. For a new assignment or renewal, we could introduce from the beginning uh, rules that would uh, make it easier to uh, to share, uh, to make more more sharing. Uh, one one thing that we said in our opinion is that uh, sharing is very very close to leasing. So since leasing is uh, uh, as a, a place in the new European code and uh, uh, should be assessed by the, um, uh, the national regulators, then also sharing should be assessed by national uh, regulation. But I, I am uh, confident that uh, uh, operator will self-regulate uh, self, uh, uh, and uh, don't come uh, to uh, us to ask to be authorized for something that uh, could not be authorized. I think uh, you had an interesting comment there that says spectrum, if I understood correctly, spectrum sharing does not equate spectrum pooling, right? Is that, or you don't want to, because if I can just give an example uh, here in Canada, we have, you know, three large uh, national operators and an, a, a, some, a, a few regional operators. And um, we have out of the three large national operators, two of them share their spectrum. They subordinate licenses to each other, and then they pull them together. They do exactly that. In the end, what you end up is you have two carriers with one network. So, uh, and, and totally on a regional basis. So, it, it certainly has, I think, has had an impact on the level of competition and pricing in, in Canada to to some extent. So, uh, I think that's a, an interesting comment. We also had, I guess we have a few minutes to go, but I'd like to, um, yes, Phil, please go no, ahead. I, I hope you can hear me because my speaker's a bit odd. Um, no, we, we I, can I think hear you. one of the things, thank you. I think one of the challenges where people talk about competition is that people, when we've been talking about making spectrum available for verticals, have been saying mobile spectrum should only be made available to particular mobile operators to make them be the people who do it. And I think there's a bit of confusion in the markets of doing it. We, we believe that actually there's a requirement by the users to be able to use Spectrum. And our job is to make Spectrum available in the most efficient way for all people to be able to use it. It's not to say the only route to doing something is through a particular player. So therefore, if we make Spectrum available directly to verticals, it's not necessarily in competition with the mobile industry doing it. It's a different route to enable people to get Spectrum because people can then make a choice of whether they buy a service using their own Spectrum, use the service through the mobile operator, or do it through a system integrator or something else. And I think, therefore, we've got to look at it from the user perspective and the market perspective, not in a way of using this as a tool to discourage or cause something to happen in a different way. And I think when people ask the question, as you saw a lot of it in the various auctions that have taken place and answers. There's a requirement for national spectrum for big mobile operators. They've got the ability to provide and use it everywhere, provide services to everybody, and for more some of these other services, whether it's in rural communities or cities or anywhere else, you're trying to find solutions to enable them to have an alternative route if that's what they prefer. Okay. Uh, since we just have a few minutes, I know we had some, two very uh, more pointed questions uh, to for Jennifer. Uh, more technical questions maybe we'd like to address. Uh, uh, Gen Jennifer, one was how many frame structures are you dealing with in each area and how many different frame structures have you experienced in total uh, from Telecom Italia? And the second question, if you see them, uh, when it comes to automated spectrum access system, what is the cost model for using the spectrum? Do users pay fees every time they access the spectrum? Sure. Um, yeah, let me address the first one. So um, uh, for the CBRS band, the Wind Forum uh, standard organization got together and um, looked at different frame structures and agreed upon two primary ones that uh, would be options for folks to choose um, in the CPRS band, one that's a little bit more even uh, uplink downlink and the other one with a more downlink um, intensive uh, structure. So, I mean, there are obviously could be more if, um, you know, if, if there were enough interest, but it was decided um, as an industry that that those two um, approaches would be sufficient. It could be changed again later, I think, uh, you know, again, were there interest, but um, so we're dealing with two, two right now. 
to the second question, um, the uh, the way to pay for the um, spectrum, uh, the, the automated sharing capability, I think is going to really be dependent on the band and the um, incumbents and the nature of the sharing and how um, uh, how frequently uh, users need to interact with the automated system in order to uh, to get their uh, frequency assignments. So in the CBRS band in the United States, you're paying, um, generally speaking, most of the SaaS administrators are um, uh, charging for a monthly fee for um, each CBSD or base station that's uh, communicating with the spectrum access system. And um, because of the military use and the need to be able to clear the band uh, very quickly within a matter of minutes uh, for the military, we have to communicate very frequently with those devices, uh, creating um, uh, you know, a greater um, uh, amount of computational capability and, um, and interactivity. So th those prices are going to be, I think, higher than in other bands where that interactivity is gonna be much lower, say the six, six gigahertz band with an AFC, where you only need to check in once a day to see whether or not any changes to uh, you know, use of that particular geography have occurred. Um, and so some of these are gonna be monthly fees. Some of these might be built into the cost of the device itself. Uh, you know, I think there are different ways of, of addressing the, the cost and um, uh, business model challenges. All right, well, I would have liked to touch based on what the future holds, but I think we're, we've, overstayed our welcome here by a minute or so. So uh, uh, I think I will thank everyone. I think it was a great panel. Thank you very much. And I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. I'll pass it back to Dan. Thank you, Joanne. And uh, thank you to all of you for, as Joanne said, uh, a, a great panel. And of course, thanks to Dave for that uh, introductory presentation about uh, CBRS as well. But no, thank you all very much. Uh, really appreciate that. And uh, again, thanks to everyone in the audience for all of your uh, comments and questions. Once again, uh, very busy on the with the comments and questions, which really is appreciated. And uh, I think uh, it's been something that's happened throughout all sessions of the event. And we really do appreciate all of the input from you all out there as well. Um, so that's about it for today. Uh, so just a reminder that uh, all of the sessions that have taken place today and all of the presentations uh, that have been made by our speakers are available to, uh, to watch back or to download. And you'll be receiving an email very shortly with the details and with uh, all the, the links for how to do that. So we are back here again tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow we start at uh, same time, or no, slightly earlier, sorry, at 9.30. Uh, Brussels time, Central European time, with a session, first of all, focusing on uh, space, so looking at delivering the next generation of secure space-based connectivity. And then we're moving on to look at some of the key bands that have uh, already come up in, in, in discussions uh, so far today. So we're going to be looking, first of all, at the UHF, uh, the sub-700 UHF bands. Then we're moving on to look at the lower six gigahertz, the upper six gigahertz, and finally, the millimeter wave band. So uh, more... Uh, interesting discussions to come tomorrow, I'm sure. And we also have our second round of showcase sessions tomorrow. So uh, looking forward to all that. So please do make sure you're back here with us at 9.30 tomorrow morning for the start of that. Uh, once again, a, a big thank you to all of our speakers today. Big thank you to all of you out there. Wishing everyone a very pleasant afternoon and evening and looking forward to seeing you all back here again tomorrow morning. Thank you very much.